Thank you, Hanko. Uh, thanks for coming up on this, showing up on this nice sunny day. Uh, yes, Pauline and I have been working together for about going on six years now. And I, we were wondering how, when we were putting this together, how should we do it? Should we sort of bounce off each other, argue with each other, you know, typical research meeting, yell at each other, have the students sit there and go, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. Or the, what we decided was to do a sort of sequential approach. So I'm doing a little bit of, if, if this word exists, historiography of our research group, of our relationship in research. And uh, then Pauline, in her second half, in the half hour following, will talk a little bit about more specific stuff on the actual work we've been doing most recently. So, in putting this together, I thought about everything that led up to that phone call that I got back in uh, 2004 from Pauline. And I was going to summarize my life in a nutshell, but I don't need to go way back to my, my PhD days. I thought I'd go back uh, a few years before I got the phone call anyway. So I've divided my talk into sort of life before Pauline, who is, of course, Dr. Schwartz to most of you. She's Pauline to me. And, uh, and then we'll get to life since the phone call. And life before Pauline, well, uh, my colleagues uh, who are here from the College of Engineering and, and from physics and so on, who are somewhat acquainted with my work in the past, know that I, my life has been chaotic for, for quite a few years. Uh, my main research has been in what we call nonlinear systems, uh, chaos, chaotic dynamics, deterministic unpredictability. My work with Pauline has been concerned with counterintuitive things, paradoxes. And so it wasn't much of a transition for me because if there's anything paradoxical, uh, there's nothing more paradoxical than the idea of deterministic unpredictability. Uh, those of you who work in nonlinear systems know that some very simple looking systems like an an inverted pendulum like this uh, can be driven into a regime where it's pretty much unpredictable. It's deterministic in the sense that you can apply Newton's laws and solve equations and so on, but then the, the response that you get, depending how you drive it, is unpredictable. So that seems to be a, a paradox in itself, the idea of determinist, an oxymoron, deterministic and unpredictability. You may have heard of the butterfly effect in the context of weather. I can assure you that the rains that we're suffering today uh, derived from a, a little butterfly <laughs> flapping its wings somewhere outside of, of Peking, Beijing, wherever and so on, a few days ago. The butterfly effect, nonlinear systems, uh, these deterministically unpredictable systems are characterized by the fact that a very small perturbation can lead to a very different outlook. And we seem to be seeing a lot of that in the world anyway. Uh, you know, one person's decision, a, a single vote can change the whole system. That's the ultimate chaotic system, uh, basically social science, politics, and so on. Uh, order within the disorder, another oxymoron, right? But those of us who work with chaotic systems, with these not complicated nonlinear systems, are acquainted with the fact that while they may look very complicated in their output, unpredictable, if you only look at them in the right way, there is some order within that disorder. Uh, and of course, how can you control something that is totally uncontrollable, right? Well, people like me try to. And <laughs> Other people like me sometimes <laughs> succeed in controlling the disorder. Uh, stochastic resonance is another thing I was involved with. It was invoked back in the early 80s to try and explain how uh, by uh, deriving from noise, global noise, you can actually enhance a, a rhythm, the, the Malakovich rhythms uh, of the ice ages, for example, and so on. So stochastic uh, resonance had a rather dubious origin and so on, but Basically, it's the idea that you can actually use noise, which is the ultimate stochasticity, unpredictability, randomness, right? You can actually use noise to enhance deterministic stuff. Notice the, the, the thread of all this, paradox, counterintuitive. Uh, small world networks, something else that I involve. You've all heard of Kevin Bacon, the movie star, of course, and the six or is it seven degrees of freedom and so on and so forth. It's another thing that I worked in on and off for years. And miscellaneous problems and puzzles. I have a problem. I have a, a disease uh, which I've coined uh, AD, 
DD, uh, academic, <laughs> no, uh, academic uh, interest disorder or something, or distraction disorder. Namely, again, my immediate colleagues know that if they just mention a problem to work on, I'm easily distracted and I, I might go and spend three months trying yeah. to solve the problem and so on. So whatever affliction that is, I think I suffer from it. Uh, well, here's an example of chaos. Uh, you know, it starts out looking simple enough, you know, an inverted pendulum that wiggles backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. But when you drive it, you get an output that looks for, I think all of you will agree, it's pretty unpredictable. But if you learn to look at them in the right way, you see this nice chaotic attractor, which, believe me, has some order in it. Okay, so that's the sort of thing that obsessed me on and off for a few years. Needless to say, uh, other people did all the foundation work and studied a single oscillator in great detail, and they even figured out how to control it when in the chaotic regime. So I thought, well, how about coupling a bunch of these uncontrollable things together? Maybe I can modify the, the so-called OGY mechanism to control that. And, well, I sort of made some progress, which is suggested by these graphs. But anyway, this is the sort of setup. Uh, Several years ago, I took to, uh, w when, I, I th when I felt I was getting forgetful, I decided to start recording my, my calculations in a notebook with dates. It wasn't because someday I expected somebody to treat them like Newton's manuscripts and so on and look for the dates and sort of figure out how I was thinking at the time. Uh, but this is just to give you an indication that back on, uh, what's that, July the 6th in 04, I was uh, toying with the idea, I wanted to build an icosahedron, one of the platonic uh, solids and so on. And so, me being me, I decided to go back and do all the, the geometry of it from first principles. Uh, my notebook contains the summary of covering lots and lots of pages. You know, we often have lots of false starts, us scientists, physicists, mechanical engineers, and so on. You know, we cover a lot of pages with a lot of what's the word, junk and so on, <laughs> and uh, before we finally write it up. And uh, But I, I show this date in particular because uh, because something happened a few days after that. Oh, but notice, thus far, I haven't mentioned chemistry. There's, there's no chemistry in my background. Repeat, no chemistry, <laughs> right? And there's a good reason why there's no chemistry. Uh, it, it really dates back to when I was at high school, and I, I did... I studied mathematics, physics, and chemistry in the English system for A-level, and I decided then that chemistry involved trying to flush a load of powder into a funnel and so on, and mine always spilled on the floor, and then when, and I, you know, I liked uh, the calculations and so on, which was basically physics, right? Physics is the fundamental science, but, uh, but chemistry and I did not jive. I did get through my A-level, barely, and so on. I managed to break my pipette, although you call them pipettes over here, I think, my pipette in the A-level. And I decided, you know, well, I'd known for many years that I wanted to be a theoretical physicist anyway, but that basically sealed the deal. So, no chemistry. And then along came Pauline. Uh, back in 04, I got a phone call, uh, and that led to life after Pauline. Uh, and, okay, I got this phone call out of the blue. Uh, Dr. Schwartz called me up to her office. I didn't know her. I really didn't know her. She'd been around for a few years, but I'm in the bottom left-hand corner of Buckman, and she's in the top right-hand corner, and our paths rarely crossed. Uh, so, you know, I don't know why she was calling me. I, I wasn't aware that I'd done anything wrong in faculty governance or anything, although she's the person that will... Uh, <laughs> you don't want to cross her anyway. Uh, but uh, anyway, she said, Hi, I'm Pauline. Do you want some tea or coffee? I said, okay, yeah, fine, thanks, I'm Carl. And she said, Perondo paradox. I said, okay, fine, what is that? And, okay, she decided that she, well, she knew about the Perondo paradox, which is a paradox from game theory. The idea is that you've got a couple of games. One game is real simple. It's a, it's a tossing a coin, but it's a bias coin. And it's biased in such a way that you're going to lose. All right? And there's a second game that is a bit more complicated, and the outcome of that depends on uh, the, the previous output of playing the games and so on. But individually, the games lose. They're both losing games. But, turns out, this guy Perondo, German guy, right? Mm -hmm. Spanish. Spanish. Oh, yeah. Yep. Let's not confuse yep. those. All right? Germany's trying to bail out Spain, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the Perondo, uh, a Spanish guy, 
came up with this paradox whereby, and this is provable, uh, that if you play the games alternately, you can get a winning output. You can take that to the casino. You're not going to get rich off it, but the reality is that two losing games played alternately, and that can be randomly alternately, it can be chaotically alternately, it can be just simple alternation. This game, that game, this game, that game, does lead within a certain region of parameter space to a winning outcome. That's paradoxical. I said, okay, you know, I think she had some Starbucks at the time, fine, right, <laughs> humor me. And she said, I want to apply it to chemistry. Okay, uh, well, all right, there'll be a bit more on that. Uh, but then one thing led to another. She, she also managed to attract some pretty bright students that have gotten surf fellowships, NASA fellowships over the years, uh, astrobiology money from NASA as well. And uh, so I thought, you know, I've got this affliction, you know, academic uh, concentration disorder or whatever. I will be distracted. Okay, and that was the beginning of life after Pauline. Uh, after the Perondo paradox uh, work, it did lead to a paper. Uh, we, she came up with another paradox. Now this guy is German, right? Yes. Wolfgang Braes, Baron von Braes, or somebody, oh somebody Braes anyway. He's got a paradox. Got nothing to do with chemistry. This one is to do with transportation theory. The idea is, it turns out that years ago, 42nd Street, they closed 42nd Street, and it actually improved the flow of traffic. And back in Germany, they actually built uh, a freeway, an extra conduit and so on, and that caused congestion. That's kind of paradoxical. Uh, so I thought, yeah, this might be worth a challenge, another bit of distraction, okay. Uh, and long story short, it led to an application in chemistry, another paper, uh, Bright Surf students. Polymerase chain reaction, that got Kelly Gillis, Car Carrie, Carrie Mullis, yes. the Nobel Prize many years ago. A very, very clever way of replicating DNA over and over and over again and so on. Okay, what's that got to do with me? You know, I'm a mechanical engineer. You know, I, I construct icosahedrons and dodecahedrons and I play around with chaotic systems and, you know, I teach uh, thermodynamics. Okay, PCR. Well, needless to say, I have to learn some stuff as well. Uh, but we came up with a way of using our, our innovations to actually model PCR as well. And then, uh, to bring us nearer to the present, prebiotic chemistry, Pauline decided uh, that uh, it's time to explain the origin of life. All right, fine, you know, uh, let me work on that over the weekend as well. <laughs> and so, prebiotic chemistry. You'll get a flavor of that last thing in her talk. Basically, uh, Proof of chiral symmetry breaking. Now, as soon as she mentions chiral symmetry breaking, of course, it reminds me of when I did go up to Cambridge as a, a fresh, wet behind the ears uh, PhD student. You know, I, I, uh, the, the Cavendish lab had said, read these books on particle physics. I didn't know anything about elementary particle theory and so on, but it had stuff about the, the four forces of nature and the weak and electromagnetic currents and so on, uh, forces and the W boson and the Z boson and chiral symmetry breaking. Yes, chiral symmetry breaking exists in the universe. Didn't occur to me at that time that 30 years well, a few years later, uh, <laughs> that uh, after dropping chemistry as well, good riddance forever, right, uh, that I would be revisiting chiral symmetry breaking. But the fact of the matter is that the chiral symmetry breaking that is, in, uh, that is affiliated with the, 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 the weak nuclear force probably, this is a theory, probably had some influence on the chiral symmetry breaking, caused the chiral symmetry breaking that makes all of us, all of our amino acids left-handed and our sugars right-handed. Okay, more on that later. Uh, explaining the origin of life, okay, that's our present quest. And I'm sure one of our students, I, I think when we release our students, and two of our students have gone to uh, one has gone to Dartmouth and one's gone to Cornell, and at least one of them may well get the Nobel Prize someday. So I'm, I'm, we've we've made them pledge to invite us to the the ceremony at least. So and maybe we'll even get a little bit of a recognition for the great work they've done. Uh, Carol symmetry breaking in prebiotic Earth. Okay, the Perondo paradox. Notice that's my entry a few days after my icosahedron. This represented a very strenuous weekend of calculating all weekend. That's that's basically the summary, uh, that's the first page of the summary of what I managed to dig up 
for those in mathematics like Ramesh, Markov processes. Okay? Nod your head. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, uh, that's the Pirando pr paradox anyway, game theory. <coughs> Two losing games. You like you okay, right. That'll be another seminar. All right. Two losing games alternately played can have a winning outcome. Uh, these are some of the papers we've published in recent years. Uh, there's some equations on the cover of it. Uh, this was the one on the Pirando paradox. Uh, it's the Osipovich Barrett Schwartz. Uh, paper, and you see the mention of game, game A, game B, and so on, and but uh, long story short, what's this got to do with chemistry? Okay, it's thinking out of the box. Two games, game A, game B. How can we connect that with chemistry? How about running a process at two different temperatures? Temperature one, temperature two. Furthermore, let's alternate the temperature. How about that? It's total, you know, it's putting I don't know, a hammer together with a screwdriver and getting a space shuttle or something. I don't know, but it, it's, think, it's called thinking out of the box. Turns out that the thinking paid off because if you just focus in on this graph, here's the response of a chemical system at one temperature, constant temperature. Here's the response at another temperature. If you alternate the temperature, look what happens. It blows up. That sounds good. I think the pharmaceutical industry is probably calling us, right? Uh, this is the key graph with all the pixelation. Uh, the proof that we're famous, okay? <laughs> Do a Google search. Two words only, Perondo chemistry. Now, some of you may be thinking, okay, that's an oxymoron. And anyway, who the heck would connect Perondo with chemistry anyway? So surely, the fact of the matter is, if you do a Google search of Perondo chemistry, the first three entries are our paper. Now, that sounds pretty good, right? Okay, isn't that the definition of fame nowadays? Anyway, so as long as you remember the words Perondo and Paradox, you don't have to do much of a search in Google or Yahoo uh, to, for our name to come up. Well, actually, it's Osipovich, isn't it? But no, I'm, I made that one. Oh, Tom, he's there as well. Uh, the paper on the Braze Paradox Braze paradox, an interesting phenomenon whereby the introduction of additional ca capacity, maybe an extra roadway or something, in some simple network systems can lead to an unexpected reduction in the overall flow rate of traffic through the system. What's this got to do with chemistry? Chemical processes, reversible processes. Okay, if we open up another chemical process, will that provide inhibition or will it make it even better? Turns out that it can actually inhibit. Again, maybe the drug companies are interested in that because they may think by introducing this process they're producing more of a chemical, maybe they're inhibiting their process. And maybe if they put in some inhibition, like some reversibility in the processes, maybe they'd produce more product. That sounds as though somebody should take it seriously anyway. That journal did. There's a bit of a network up there. And his basically without the extra pathway and with it, without it is better. The paradox is being realized in chemistry. There's our paper on the polymerase chain reaction. Uh, and more recently, we had a bit of fun, at least Brandy uh, and Dante. And oh, well, Brandy's here. Brandy Mono is here. And Jackie's here. She's going to feature in the next paper uh, with Brandy. And maybe we'll get a mention as well, right? Uh, and uh, this was a cute thing they, they put together using an iPad to uh, look at the, uh, evidently iPads put out polarized light and uh, chemicals, uh, racemic or chirally asymmetric chemicals rotate light in different directions and you can use an iPad to do chemistry. Amazing. <laughs> actually on the iPad, not just using it, keying in, you actually put the chemical on the iPad and you see the rotation of light. You do need another polarizer, as uh, sunglasses would do. Uh, here's some, um, uh, since I want to turn over to Pauline in just a jiffy, uh, here's some photographs from our recent past. Uh, there's Dan and Tom. Tom. Uh, that was a presentation they made at Pfizer. Uh, that's the thermal cycling paper, the one that everybody who checks Perondo chemistry on, on Google will find. Uh, and there's Dante. He's gone to Cornell. 
uh, PhD program at Cornell. There he is with his enantiomers, you know, his mirror image molecules that uh, physically are very much alike in terms of mass are very much alike. Chemically they behaved, uh, behave identically but, you, uh, but there's a huge difference between a left and a right-handed uh, enantiomer. Uh, they may be mirror images of each other, but when you try plugging them into proteins and so on, one might be a drug, one might, uh, the, the, its partner uh, might well be a poison. Uh, one enantiomer might smell like lemon, another one might smell like turpentine. One uh, was used, uh, one enantiomer was used for morning sickness, and its, uh, its sibling, its mirror image enantiomer, uh, caused the, uh, caused Oh, oh, the teratotoxin, the um, birth defects. Yeah, birth defects. Sorry, no, the yeah, well, birth defects. Yeah. Anyway, I'll think of the word. It's it's just a blank. Uh, thalidomide. Thank you, thank you, oh. Matthew. Thalidomide. So on the one hand, you have a cure for morning sickness. Its partner that looks identical, 99% identical, caused thalidomide. Uh, and there's Jackie and Brandy, and me, since my little goatee and Pauline, and that's my life since Pauline in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, I've mentioned some of the things we've worked on. It's not everything we've worked on. We have published some of those things. They have been cited by people who know something about the field. And uh, we're working on other things, and the, the latest thing we're working on is explaining the chiral symmetry breaking, basically the origin of life. Uh, so over to Pauline. Thank you. Why don't you give me that so that I can get it out of your hands because otherwise you'll do something crazy. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so thank you. And again, thank you all for, for being here. Let's see if we can move this along and tell you a little bit more of the science that we're uh, handling uh, recently in the labs. And you might look at this and say, well, what's going on there? There is a title, okay. But somehow that background looks rather unusual. There it is there. And I hope you look at that and say, that doesn't quite feel comfortable. Well, here's another one. If you look at it, a little bit odd. Here's another one. Here's another one. These are asymmetrical. And usually when you think of symmetry, things look very beautiful and organized. And we live in create our buildings and the like in such a symmetrical way, but these patterns that I've just shown you are quite asymmetrical. Well, it works out, a fellow by the name of Dan Schechner in the early 1980s, he was looking at some crystals uh, in the laboratory. Um, his first ones were simple ones of aluminum and silver, and he found that they made unusual shapes like that. In fact, what you've seen are models of these crystals. And when he told people about it, people in chemistry, they said, Dan, you're wrong. You know, you must have had some contamination. You're doing something wrong. Crystals are always symmetrical, always symmetrical. And he said, no, 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 I've been very careful. I've double checked. These are quasi crystals. They're not symmetrical. It looked a long time for him to follow up on this discovery. But in fact, he was quite right, and he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry this year for his discovery of quasi-crystals, which we now understand are a crystal form that's rather interesting and rather different from what we've always expected before that time. So this notion of asymmetry is something that I really want to tell you a little bit more about. And it's obviously going to make a, a difference in the sum of chemistry that we're talking about. But this asymmetry. It's not just right now, it's not something, and as Carl indicated, there's some things, that, the very beginning of our universe. So here, in our universe, and there, yes, indeed, may be others, but there was a basic asymmetry, and there may be several versions of this asymmetry that were very critical to the evolution of our universe. And here's one or a couple things that I wanted to bring to your attention. Here's the Big Bang. And we can all take a look at something as simple as E equals MC squared. And we know that all of the energy that was associated with Big Bang, again, as it expanded and began to cool, that energy, some of it became matter. And for 
what we expect is equal amounts of what we call matter and equal amounts of antimatter. However, with that particular type of universe, if we had an equal amount of matter and antimatter, they would have annihilated one another. And so any universe which was perfectly symmetrical like that wouldn't exist. So our universe has this basic asymmetry, and if it didn't, we wouldn't be here talking about it. Okay? That asymmetry is very, very subtle. Somehow, we know some of this, but not all. We're certainly not, we don't have proof. We have what thing, things that contribute to our evidence. A set of phenomena contributed to a small asymmetry that favored matter. Take a look at this. That asymmetry is on the order of one part over of matter to 10 billion. So 10 billion and one particles of matter, 10 billion of antimatter, annihilation, you get a little bit of extra matter. That little bit of extra matter is our entire universe. And I wanted to bring that picture because there, there's all the matter. Okay, this is a picture of our universe about 380,000 years old, and it's not symmetrical. There's differences in density here, and if there weren't, no, none of us would be here. So here is something our universe is, has this piece of asymmetry that we have to appreciate. And now I want to fast forward to the Earth. So here, early Earth and this idea of prebiotic chemistry. For about a billion years, when the Earth was formed, 4.7 billion years, so almost a billion years later, there was no life on Earth. Some life has been at least, there's pretty good evidence that it's this old, 3.8 billion years old. Again, unusual single cells. We could talk about that for a long time, but that's not where we're going. We're interested in this billion year period before life, okay, what they call abiotic, and we're interested in the chemistry. What was the chemistry that was happening in that billion years to make the molecules, to make the important uh, molecules and macromolecules that allowed Earth to, uh, to allow life to form on Earth? So what do we have here? Early Earth, it was your hot, okay? We have energy, plenty of energy from the sun, hydrothermal energy from the Earth itself, the heat of the Earth, and plenty of lightning as well, which was also a very interesting source of energy. Plenty of energy. Here's some of the small molecules, water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, nitrogen. Please know what's missing there. No oxygen. There was an oxygen for several billions of years. That oxygen is a signature of life. It's one of the things they look for when they look at these planets that we're finding out there. Is there any oxygen? That's oxygen may be an indication that there's life on those planets. So very early on, no oxygen. Plenty of other inorganic goodies, iron, sil uh, silicon, all kinds of things, and their salts, clays, all kinds of things like that. And very early on, these small molecules can undergo synthetic reactions. You could do it in the laboratory, and you can make a bunch of these different things. But these are all small molecules. And some of these are names you recognize, acetic acid, uh, hydrogen cyanide, acetylene. These are all small molecules that certainly would have been on our early Earth. Now, please understand, there's a lot of people who will ask, well, what about the different, how much of these things? And uh, what's the concentrations and things like that? We don't have precise answers. And what we have is evidence that suggests that we know something about what has happened in that one billion years before there was life on Earth. But one thing we know has to have happened. We have to make something beyond these small molecules. So here is some of the very interesting science done in the 1950s, 1952, by a fellow by the name of uh, Yuri and a fellow by the name of Miller. And they made this little mini Earth, if you will. And so here they threw in here a bunch of chemicals that they thought 
uh, would have been present on our early Earth. And they heated it up. So there's a heating element here. And this thing is boiling and condensing and going round and round. But please notice these little electrodes. They mimicked lightning. Okay. So um, Miller put all these things together, made this nice little glassware, put this together, and let it bubble and bubble and bubble. And a couple days later, he came back, and there's this goo, this brown goo, all over the place. And he analyzed that brown glue and found what was in this goo. Amino acids were in this goo. Purines and pyrimidines were in this goo. And many people now have repeated those experiments have done them with a little more sophistication, different concentrations, temperatures, time element. All of the amino acids we know can be made in some crude little system like this. So here's some chemistry, starting with all these small molecules. Here's one of 20 some common amino acids that can be made in something this crude. That's not just amino acids, of course, but with systems something like that, you can make what are called monomers. And again, just to teach you a little chemistry, monomers then can build up one after the other after the other. They can link together to make polymers. Okay? Well, why are those polymers interesting to us? Well, monomers here, things like amino acids, purines, pyrimidines, sugars. And these monomers can link together to make these polymers polypeptides if they're small, proteins if they're a bit bigger, nucleic acids like RNA and DNA. These are the interesting molecules if you're interested in how life evolved here on our Earth. Because it's these macromolecules that transmit information. Of course, we all think of DNA as a code for the information in us. But please ask early on. What was that possibility? It may have been RNA held the code for the very first and earliest <coughs> life forms. They also perform other functions needed for life, like catalysis. Again, in R now, the catalysts are generally proteins. They're uh, enzymes. It may have been RNA that did both of these things very, very early on, billions of years ago. Here's something that's important for our discussion, the shapes of macromolecules. The shapes are very important. Now, very often when you think of these things or see them in a textbook, they're drawn out like a linear sort of one right after the other polymer. Please understand, not true. These things fold and have three-dimensional shapes. And those three-dimensional shapes are extremely important because without those shapes, you really would not have information and function tasks that these macromolecules can perform. So if those shapes are disordered, then they will not function. Shape is really important. And that's really what's going to be talking about here in this next slide. Because here's the problem. Chemical synthesis of amino acids, and we're pretty much limiting our discussion here to that, yields both left-handed and right-handed forms of amino acids. So here is my important prop. OK, so here's a right-handed glove. And here's my left-handed glove. And whenever I chemically try to make amino acids, I make both of these at the same time. In fact, if you were to look at that Miller-Urey goo, they made amino acids. And when they looked carefully, they made all 20 amino acids, but both right-handed and left-handed. But all life on Earth, us, trees, bacteria, dogs, cats, viruses, only use left-handed amino acids. That was easy for me to know, but how the hell did that happen? How did life only use left-handed amino acids. How did this asymmetry come about? I think I'm going to tell you a little bit, just a piece, about how we think it may have had indeed happened. So this is called breaking chiral, handed breaking chiral symmetry. Thank you. <laughs> 
Where did it go? I'm a right-handed yoga. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it works out. This is not a little question. It's actually a big question. It's a big question in chemistry and, in fact, all of science. And it hasn't been totally answered yet, although you can imagine there's lots of pliers. It's important to understand this not only for life on Earth, but life everywhere, because those monomers and their shapes are very, very important for functioning macromolecules. So our research that we led you to understand a little bit about its background, it didn't start looking at uh, prebiotic chemistry. We wandered into that because of the uh, molecular models that we were looking at. All computational, by the way, all theoretical, if you will. And we looked at some chemical systems. I'm going to show you one of them. Again, it looks perfectly symmetrical. And when I mean symmetrical, you're going to see that um, all of the reactions for R, there's an actual identical reaction for S, and we start with identical concentrations of R and S. There's no edge for any one. And yet, when we run, and when we say run, we mean on the computer, we have computational programs that allow us to do an experiment on the computer. And when we run this, we sound something quite remarkable. There was a period of equilibrium, and then that equilibrium spontaneously broke. Let me remind you what you know and learn about equilibrium. When you think about chemical equilibrium, you think about dynamical systems, you know, left hit going in the forward reaction or going in the reverse reaction. And once you get to equilibrium, it may be a dynamic equilibrium, but in gross respects, it doesn't change. Once you're at equilibrium, no big changes take place. Well, what about the biologists? What do the biologists learn about equilibrium? If you look at a living system and you say that's equilibrium, it's dead. No more change. So generally, when you think about equilibrium, you think about a, a, a molecular system or a gross system where there's no further change. I'm going to show you something different that we found. Here is our reaction. And unfortunately, uh, some of the technology that I brought isn't working. I wanted to point out some things, actually, with a keyboard. But here is a precursor molecule, just called X. Again, computers don't know one from the other. And X is going to lead to both R and S. And so X is a precursor that's making the amino acids. C is some catalytic surface. Could be a mineral, could be uh, some kind of other kind of surface. And so what you're seeing is these complexes form. And then here's making R and S. And so we start with a little bit of R and S, but equal amounts. And if you look at each of these reactions, like this, this is the kinetics piece over here, identical. And if you look at these, they're identical. These two, and they're identical. And these two, and they're identical. And so input into our computer, temperature, okay, and then these equal concentrations. And then you push the button and you say run. And in a minute or two later, sometimes it's shorter than that, it gives you a graph. And again, this was a little bit, so here's X. There's X leading to R or X leading to S, the right-handed and S left-handed amino acids, for example. And they're in equilibrium and both depending on that catalytic surface. And here's what's so surprising. You get to equilibrium, but at some point, that equilibrium is not stable, and it breaks. And so now, instead of gloves, we have, here's our amino acids. This happens to be one that we're interested in called serine. And here they are. These are identical. They're mirror images of one another. Chemically, physically, they have properties in common. And if you start with an equal amount of them, you would imagine what would, you, what would happen. We have this system 
Now what's odd about this system is this system, and this is where all this math comes in, and my math colleague, is this system is nonlinear. Okay? Now most of the everything you learn, okay, chemistry, physics, biology, life in general, we tend to learn about linear systems. This goes up, that goes up. Goes up a little more, goes up a little more. Nonlinear systems, you saw some of those unusual patterns, are not easily described in this way. And that system, that chemical system that I showed you, even though it looks so symmetrical, it's not. And as a result, here's these two amino acids. And you should have waited, because what am I going to do? And this is the only one that's left over. There it is there, S. Okay. This is called breaking chiral symmetry. And we think we have some simple chemical systems, because they look so symmetrical, that have this unusual property that you would not have expected. That's all the throwing I'm going to do. You can. So we had to explore this. This was very unusual. And we have explored this by two different computational methods. This one here is a deterministic model. Again, it uses computers, yes, indeed. But it calculates rates over time. Okay, and it calculates this. This is actually a graph from our computer. And so you give it equal amounts of R and S, and out come this break. Lots more S, very little R. We looked at another computer program, totally different. And this one is what they call stochastic. That word came up a little bit in, in Carl's talk, and it has to do with probabilities. So in this, you just let them run. Put in 100,000 molecules. Chung, 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 wait a couple of minutes, and ask what happens with those reactions, with those kinetics that you saw earlier. And we saw somewhat the same thing. Notice differences in how long at that equilibrium lasts, but then this bifurcation, this break in symmetry. We think that this is going to be critical to understanding how certain amino acids, like serine, may have actually then predominated in one-handed form. Once that may have been happened, once that happened with one particular amino acid, it may have been the template for all the others, and hence a very early idea of what may have happened on our Earth. Now, Carl's part was to very much understand not only all this crazy chemistry, but be a very incredible part to the mathematics of understanding breaking symmetry. Because this is probably, there may be, what, a dozen papers in this area, um, maybe by about three or four groups around the country that have found this kind of breaking symmetry. So we have still more work to do, please understand. But there is a mathematical basis for this that allows us to understand that even though you're at equilibrium, that this is a rather special equilibrium. Because as soon as you leave a little bit, if you just jump off a little bit, Instead of returning to that equilibrium state, it breaks away. It's unstable. And there's wonderful mathematics to help us understand that instability in the particular equilibrium system that we're exploring. So here is a poster that uh, you saw uh, Brandy and Jackie presented at the SURF meeting. And here's some of these uh, pictures here, these the two different programs that we've used. It's very temperature dependent, please. So we, there's lots more that I certainly can't tell you even in a few minutes. Here's this mathematical analysis of the stability with an equilibrium, an unstable equilibrium that is breaking. And we think that this is a very important clue as to what may have been happening in the chemistry on the early Earth. So here we have a lot more to do. But we are certainly on to something really, really interesting about the synthesis of amino acids and other building blocks like the sugars that we talked about on the early Earth. Since breaking chiral symmetry must occur early to make the important monomers, and those have to be in the right shape, those monomers that are the building blocks for the polymers like DNA and RNA and proteins, 
we believe that this process may be a fundamental signature of life. So that's what we think we're into. So here, big picture for you guys, asymmetries are interesting, okay? Look beyond the symmetries of our life to the asymmetries. They are interesting, intriguing, and they may just give you clues to things that you hadn't thought of before, maybe into the nature of the universe and the nature of life. We have lots to do, but now, so Carl, come up and join me, because this is more your slide than mine. <clears throat> Okay. Come on. <laughs> Where are we now? And Lotka Volterra. Okay. Um, um, <laughs> rabbits Doyle. and rabbits and cheetahs. Yeah. So this is another, <laughs> you know, idea that's never been brought to chemistry before. And Lotka Volterra is the mathematical basis of what you call predator-prey relationships. If you look at populations of foxes and rabbits, well, foxes eat the rabbits, but if they eat all the rabbits. No more foxes. Rabbits, well, hey, they'd be fine without the foxes, okay? But if you look at that, the populations of rabbits and populations of foxes oscillate back and forth. So we said, is there interesting chemistry here? Okay? And so we are indeed playing with that. And Dan uh, Ray Doyle, who's not here but is uh, uh, pursuing a, um, a master's degree in the cellular and molecular biology, is asking if those kinds of predator-prey relationships on a chemistry scale will help us understand the metabolism and the cycles of metabolism that may have occurred on the early Earth. Did they develop into more and more complex <coughs> metabolic systems necessary for life? <sighs> chemistry, you think? Maybe. <laughs> Well, the, yeah, the lotka volterra equations, which have been studied in many different contexts. I mean, predator-prey analysis is pretty well known, but when you look at them, you notice that uh, they can be tailored to describe autocatalytic reactions, mm -hmm. which is basically the germ of the nonlinear systems that are leading to the chiral symmetry breaking. So, you know, you, you've got a point over there, and you've got a point here, and we're going to try and produce a lot of dotted dots and join the dots to form a connection. Mm -hmm. And so we may have some interesting ideas about um, early metabolic systems, again, that might be related to something that nobody would have anticipated. So, um, yeah, we're hoping, we're working on it. And so stay tuned, maybe next time we'll talk about our metabolic work. We have a lot of people to thank, uh, and so please let us do so. I have to thank Carl. Carl, thank you. Because please understand, the, uh, as interesting as some of the chemistry, and he was nice enough to give me a, a lot of chemistry credit, it wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have been certainly nearly interesting and important without his input to the, the physics and the math and his certainly important questions about, can that chemically really happen? Uh, so please, Carl, thank you. And our research supported again by the university, for which I thank them, faculty awards that have supported us, uh, University Research Scholar and SURF Awards for our students uh, over the last few years, uh, Connecticut Space Grant uh, to, uh, to, to Carl and myself, fellowships to uh, Dante Lepore and to, uh, recently to Brandy as well. NASA Astrobiology Institute is interested in some of the things we're talking about. This is the branch, uh, yes, of NASA that are interested in prebiotic chemistry because this is again telling us something about what life might be elsewhere. And so we've gotten some monies that supported SURF uh, for Brandy and, and Jackie. And we have lots of other people, and many other people who've contributed to this. Uh, George Wheeler, uh, before he um, uh, left the faculty, but he's come back many times. <coughs> Paige Genovese, uh, Devin McCarthy, who's a grad student at uh, UMass Amherst. Uh, Melody Johnson, uh, now married. Uh, Christine Stanks, now married. Tom Gordon, he's somewhere on the ocean. He's in the Navy. Uh, Dan Osipovich um, um, up at uh, Dartmouth, Mac Cherubini, I don't know where he is, I don't know where Alice is either, uh, Dante at uh, Cornell, Brandy and Jackie and Ray are stuck here, uh, at least for a few more years. <coughs> Special thanks um, to the people uh, who are our spouses who put up with us, okay? Please understand, uh, many a night uh, when the phone would ring, it was somebody trying to hunt us down to find out when we were coming home for dinner. 
So uh, we owe them uh, an awful lot of thanks. Uh, Hanko, wherever you are, where are you? Hanko, thank you. Beep. Thank you for the invitation. And we thank the friends of the UNH Library for this opportunity. And be to, sure to, to thank Isabella, Isabella, my dear friend Isabella Dodds, yes. who is the motive force behind all this, right? Well, I hope yeah, so. she's the she's, main she's friend of the library. Right. And again, please understand if there was a word that I think uh, um, reflected what you had to say, that word right. was synergy. The fact that here at a university we can put together people who would otherwise not have run across one another. It's Carl and me and the students and the like. But if, for you guys, again, the, the synergy of more than the sum of its parts, that you come and you come to a, a lecture like this, you hear something, and maybe make a connection to something else that you would n otherwise never have imagined. So we're at a special place by being at a university, and it's these kinds of synergistic interactions and connections that make everybody uh, have a, a great time as we do very creative things uh, here by being at this university. So yeah. I thank you all for, for being at our presentation. So 